Um, so thanks, Jill, for organizing this and everyone else in EGP for their help over the years. And uh, so I'll present our project. And these are the main people that are involved here. Um, Scott Heptich, second author. Uh, can you guys see my mouse? Wait. Um, he's a PhD student at INRS and Leah, who's a master's student at McGill University. And I'll show some of their work and uh, other collaborative work. So some background. Um, so a couple of years ago, crude production, uh, crude bitumen production from Alberta's oil sands region totaled around 3 million barrels per day compared to around 0.5 million barrels, barrels per day for conventional crude. So over the past few years, um, non-conventional bitumen has overtaken and surpassed conventional crude as the leading source of petroleum in Alberta. And I think that probably applies to the rest of Canadian production as well. So uh, bitumen is the main source, a main source, if not the main source. And bitumen is a very viscous, highly degraded form of petroleum. So to transport bitumen via pipeline, it is required to be blended with lighter hydrocarbon fractions, yielding a less viscous that would have bitumen, and there's a, a, a wide range, a million different types of dota bitumen. Um, but for simplicity's sake here, I'll just call this dilbit today. Um, it's generally considered safer to transport uh, bitumen via pipeline compared to other means of transport, uh, compared to barge or rail. But of course, major accidents do happen, like what happened in Kalamazoo in Michigan uh, 11 years ago which has had political repercussions to this day. Um, I believe tomorrow they're supposed to close down one of the pipelines that transports uh, half of the petroleum to Ontario and Quebec. We'll see what happens there. Um, so when this proposal was written a, a few years ago or a couple of years ago, there had been some work done looking at Dilbit spills in marine environments. Um, so Dilbit has very different uh, chemical physical properties to conventional petroleum and there hadn't been that many um, studies looking at, at Dilbit at all, or actually very few very I think no studies pretty much when this was written uh, looking at Dilbit spilling in, in the uh, in shallow groundwater systems and in the uh, and in freshwater environments so that was the reason why this project um, was devised okay so the main activities within our project are to better understand the the relationships between the geochemistry, hydrology, microbiology, and toxicology during natural attenuation of Dilbit using controlled spill experiments, both in the lab and in the field where it was where it's possible. And looking at shallow groundwater systems, so looking at large tank uh, experiments that took place in the INRS Labodour facilities here in Quebec City, and also in collaboration with uh, research scientists um, at CANMET, Nicholas Udding, uh, using smaller scale glass tanks to look at, at spill of Dilbit underneath the surface. And also wave tank weathering, again, in collaboration with people at CanMet in Alberta, in Devon, and uh, in collaboration with people at Environment, Change, Environment and Climate Change Canada and University of Ottawa, looking at microbial, microbial uptake of spilled Dilbit in lake sediments. Um, in the experimental lakes area in Northwest Ontario, where they allow them to, to take, uh, to carry out very large spills in, in controlled lake environments. So I'm gonna focus just on the large columns at La Boulure and the ELA work. So the large column experiments, um, well, we needed a large, a lot of soil to get, to, to fill our large columns with. And where was that collected? It was collected from uh, McGill's Galt Nature Reserve uh, near Mont Saint-Hilaire in Quebec. And so that was a way to get um, soil that was representative of the area in Quebec in which pipelines uh, cross in the St. Lawrence lowlands and also as pristine soil as we could find in this region. So we hauled a very large amount of this soil back to La Boulure in a big, big truck, a Ford F-350, packed to the rim. We sieved it, which took a long time, uh, using a two-centimeter mesh. We homogenized it in these large 
um, shakers here in these large barrels. And then we weighed it out in each of the columns. And you see here, so these large columns, um, one meter by 60 centimeters, uh, Teflon lined stainless steel, and the soil was compacted down. And because we were adding uh, petroleum to these, to these mesocosm or large columns, they had to be kept in a ventilated uh, tent system to get rid of the fumes. And so we have five columns, and to two of them we added diluted bitumen, Cold Lake blend, and to two of them we added uh, conventional heavy crude, and one was a control where nothing was added. So this idea was to mimic a spill uh, on the surface um, and looking at effects in the battle zone, that is the unsaturated zone. So these, uh, these tanks, these large columns, we added water um, once a week in the same amount that the area around the Gulf Nature Reserve would receive by precipitation, just, you know, um, averaged out for a one-week period, uh, mimicking the, the pH of the rainwater, which is acidic because of, uh, of the acid rain around Montreal. And uh, we set this up a couple weeks before adding the petroleum, and then we monitored over 15 weeks. And so in the leachate, that is the water coming through the column, we carried out the following analysis, total organic carbon, inorganic carbon, BTEX, uh, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylenes, uh, PAHs, uh, polycyclic arom aromatic hydrocarbons, and acid extractive organics, which includes nathenic acids. So these two fractions here, BTEX and PAHs, they're, they're well-studied common contaminants that are found in petroleum. And nathenic acids are, are also found in petroleum. They're associated, as you'll see in Paul's talk next, with, uh, with the Athabasca oil sands of bitumen. And we looked at major elements and metals, and then we carried out toxicity assays on Pinophallus promulus, otherwise known as the fathead minnow, a commonly used species for these kind of toxicity tests. And we also collected cores, soil cores, uh, every two weeks from these columns. And we carried out uh, analysis of phospholipid fatty acids, which are microbial biomarkers for the active microbial population. And we carried out compound specific carbon-13 analysis of the PLFAs, and also a uh, microbial community analysis, um, 16S RNA amplicon sequencing. So I'm not gonna show any of the data from the cores, I'll, I'll show the data from the leachate for the experiments just uh, in, this, in the interest of time. And some of the analysis that are ongoing in the silicores are um, compound specific carbon-14 analysis of PLFAs to get a better idea of, of the microbial uptake of fossil carbon. I'll explain that later in a, another slide, what that means. Um, TPH concentrations, total petroleum hydrocarbons, pHs in the soil, and compound specific carbon-13 and deuterium analysis of the pHs over time to see how weathering, natural weathering would affect the carbon-13 and deuterium signatures of pHs in the petroleum over time. But again, I'll just focus on the leachate. So here's the BTEX, and just using, showing one of the, the large columns, DB1 for Dilbert 1, CC1 for conventional crude 1. So here you have uh, uh, the concentration of BTEX on the y-axis uh, over time on the x-axis. And you see that in both the conventional crude and the Dilbit columns, you have a spike in the BTEX uh, at around day 13, after two weeks, roughly. And unsurprisingly, the, the concentration of BTEX was higher in the DB column than the conventional crude column, what was coming out in the leachate. Um, because as I mentioned, Dilbit, they combine, to make, to make Dilbit, they combine bitumen with a, with a lighter hydrocarbon fractions and often that contains higher amounts of BTEX. So leachate pHs. Um, the pHs, the pHs uh, especially the larger ring ones, four, five, and six, their solubility is very low. So we didn't expect to see a lot of pHs in the soil anyway, but we didn't expect to see pHs that are this low. This is very, very low. This is parts per trillion, nanograms per liter. So you can see here that uh, there's pretty much uh, negligible um, trends and all very low concentrations of pHs in the water. 
Um, yeah, so orders of magnitude below the drinking water standards. Um, and you can see a slight maybe increase in the control at the end. That's probably to do with the, the fact that uh, just the ambient levels of the pHs in the atmosphere in, in, the, <clears throat> in the Abelur, after three months of carrying out the experiments, you're going to have a tiny amount of pH increase. But again, as I mentioned, this, these are very, very low. So basically, no pH is in the water. So AEOs, the acid extracted organics containing naphthenic acids, again, very, very low. Um, no, no increase, um, no substantial increase over time, a slight increase over time, um, which I'll get to in the next slide, even in the, even in the control. But you can see there's maybe slightly higher increase of AEOs um, in both the Dilbit and conventional crude columns over time. And so the majority of the, uh, as I'll get in this slide, so I'll show some of the Orbitrap high resolution mass spectator from these AEOs. So the majority, the majority of the uh, AEOs showed signs that, the, that these compounds were comprised of natural, naturally occurring fatty acids. And so the O2 species here is what you look for in ethenic acids. It's, it's pretty low in comparison to other more um, higher oxygenated compounds reflected, reflective of uh, humic and fulvic acids. And so on control, as an example here in DB1 column and the control column, there's a pretty similar distribution of the, of the major species classes. I'm not gonna go into too much of what this means, but these are the major species classes in the in the AEOs over, uh, in, in on day zero, and there's, there's a slight modification on day 104, which is the uh, the end of the experiment. Um, still pretty similar distributions. Uh, even in the control, you see that there's some kind of reworking of the natural organic matter going on in the columns. But one difference does does stick out here is that you do have a higher um, O3s species indicating that within the acid extractor organic fraction, you're having some kind of oxidation of, of uh, sulfur within the petroleum. And that might be, that might be uh, a reason for the increase in toxicity, which I'll get to later. So trace metals, again, we have, we have nothing significant over time uh, in any of the metals we analyzed. So malformations in uh, mad, a fathead minnow larvae um, they're, they're not, you know, compared to other studies that I've looked at, you know, uh, toxicity in, in, in petroleum, you know, the, the, the malformations were significant and greater than the control, but they weren't substantial, especially towards the end of the experiment. But they were statistically different in the controls in the first three days. So this coincides potentially with the BTEC spike that you saw coming in the first, first three days, uh, first uh, three weeks rather. And uh, potentially with some of the, some compounds that we actually didn't measure, like some oxidized uh, pHs or oxidized petroleum compounds or sulfur-containing compounds that uh, that escape the kind of like you know the regular detection net when people look at contaminants from from petroleum. So this is ongoing work still for interpreting the data. So now I'll present some data from the uh, experimental lakes area work. So these uh, experiments were carried out by people at University of Ottawa, as I mentioned, and ECCC, uh, and people also working at ELA itself. Uh, they were carried out in summer of 2018, and they added uh, various amounts of dilbit to these limnal corrals, which I'll show a picture of in the next slide. And they monitored the, the dilbit in the in the water and sediments over 70 days and for the work that i'm i'll be showing it's results from uh, sediments that were collected from various treatments at the end of the study so what is a limnal corral well it's it's this uh exactly what it i guess describes a big corral in a lim <laughs> limno and limnology so these large um these large uh, enclosed um water bodies in which they add a petroleum that are separated by, that are, that are contained by an impermeable curtain. And they have sampling ports and they have uh, ways to maintain the petroleum in the system so nothing escapes. And the lake's about two meters deep at this point where they carried out the experiments. And so our sediment samples were collected by 
by um, a grab core um, in one of these windmill corrals. So now I'll describe to you uh, how to interpret PLFA data. So what are PLFAs again? Though I mentioned they're biomarkers for the active microbial community. They're, they're found on, in cell membranes. And so, you know, there's a, these, there are lipids that have a phosphate group. And I'm not going to get too much into what the distributions of individual PLFAs mean, but in terms of carbon-13 and carbon-14 analysis, um, they can provide insight into microbial and carbon sources. And so looking at the carbon-13 and carbon-14 values of individual or groups of PLFAs can be very, very insightful. So here's the distributions uh, across five, six samples, uh, sorry, five samples that were collected from, uh, from the experiment in, in the Experimental Lakes area. And the highest one is 2001, where they added 180 liters of dilbit. The lowest one was 2006, 1 1.5 liters of dilbit. Medium, right here, the, the yellow one, 18 liters of dilbit. And two controls, um, where they, there's obviously no liters of dilbit. And another control, DB0282, which was sediment taken from, from the lake prior to the study. So basically two controls. And you can see the distributions themselves, just, just looking at the individual PLFAs wouldn't provide much information about what's going on there because the distribution's pretty much all the same. I mean, that does give you un, some indication that there's not a lot going on, but it by itself wouldn't be entirely conclusive. And that's where, where carbon-13 and 14 isotopes come in, come in handy. So here we have the same samples. Carbon-13 signature on the left axis, um, groups or individual PLFAs on the y-axis. And so here we, we see similarity for most of the PLFAs, except for some here. Uh, the most contaminated ones, DB2001 uh, and DB2007, uh, for two groups here, 16 unsaturated PLFAs, are slightly more enriched um, than the other ones, the controls and the less contaminated ones, uh, perhaps indicating that, well, what you're doing here, a more depleted signature, just to point out, is indicative of, of consumption potentially of methane, which is very depleted. And so that, that very depleted signature gets uh, incorporated into the PLFAs. And also, it could also be uh, indicative of an algal signature. So what that, this might be telling you potentially is that, is that the addition of large amounts of petroleum are affecting the microbial community and that they're, they're limiting the ability for the natural community to take up methane or algal to take, you know, it's somehow having a negative impact on the pre-existing um, microbial community. And we're still waiting on, on DNA analysis to see how that correlates with that data. Um, but interestingly, you don't see a lot of impact on the C14. So here we have carbon-14 signature, uh, just as a Reminder for those who aren't familiar with this, the scale minus 1,000 per mil by definition means it has no detectable C14. So anything older than around 50,000 years old, like, like petroleum. And modern organic carbon, uh, depending upon where it was in, the, uh, in terms of the, the bomb signature from the 1960s will be above zero. And so you see here that it's all what's considered modern, made within the last few decades. But there is a slight indication that the, mo the most contaminated um, sample, 2001, there's a slight indication that it was starting to, to that microbes in this, in this limnal corral were starting to use the petroleum as their carbon source. So this is only carried out over 70 days. You know, if it was carried out longer, perhaps, who knows, you know, it'd be interesting to have a longer term, a longer series um, of data, but, uh, um, unfortunately, that was, you know, the ELA, ELA is, is, is under, is, is, is widely sought after for, for use for a lot of different experiments. And so I don't think they're able to run it for more than uh, two, three months. Anyway. It would be time to conclude, uh, Jason, please. Is that it? Okay. Anyway, that's the last slide. Oh. And so uh, <laughs> I just like to thank everyone involved in the project, uh, especially those in the Delta Lab, lab um, John Headley and Kerry Pru at Environment Canada for the uh, Overtrap high-res mass spec data and all the collaborators who provided in-kind support uh, for this study. And just one more slide. Uh, um, this is a photograph taken from the top of one of the, the, uh, the, the large column experiments that, that were 
that we added Dilbit to. This was one year after we did anything to it. We stopped watering it. We stopped looking after it one year. So you can see there's a little indication that life persists even in the <laughs> column. So it's, it's what plants crave, apparently.